it's a pleasure to be with you again. I think it was 2012, maybe the last time I was here uh, when Steve uh, needed someone uh, again. I'm just glad to be here. So uh, this morning, I want to uh, read the second reading from Galatians uh, chapter 2, verses 15 through 21 from Eugene Peterson's The Message. So <clears throat> it's a little different uh, verbiage um, than uh, some of our other uh, traditional texts, but you can uh, follow, listen along. And I hope that you can all hear me. Yes? Okay, good. So let us pray and listen for God's word. We Jews know that we have no advantage of birth over non-Jewish sinners. We know very well that we are not set right with God by rule, keeping but only through personal faith in Jesus Christ. How do we know? We tried it. And we had the best system of rules the world has ever seen. Convinced that no human being can please God by self-improvement, we believed in Jesus as the Messiah so that we might be set right before God by trusting in the Messiah, not by trusting to be good. Have some of you noticed that we are not yet perfect? No great surprise, right? And are you ready to make the accusation that since people like me, who go through Christ in order to get things right with God, aren't perfectly virtuous, Christ must therefore be an accessory to sin? The accusation is frivolous. If I was trying to be good, I would be rebuilding the same old barn I tore down. I would be acting as a charlatan. What actually took place is this. I tried keeping rules and working my head off to please God. And it didn't work. So I quit being a lawman so that I could be God's man. Christ's life showed me how and enabled me to do it. I identified myself completely with him. Indeed, I have been crucified with Christ. My ego is no longer central. It is no longer important that I appear righteous before you or have your good opinion. And I am no longer driven to impress God. Christ lives in me. The life you see me living is not mine, but it is lived by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I am not going to go back on that. It is not clear to you that to go back to that old rule keeping, is it not clear to you that to go back on that old rule keeping peer-pleasing religion would be an abandonment of everything personal and free in my relationship with God. I refuse to do that, to repudiate God's grace. If a living relationship with God could come by rule keeping, then Christ died unnecessarily. The word of the Lord. So it was probably my um, oversight not to get the title of the sermon in your bulletin, but um, it's um, the title I did give this was Keeping Our Faith Forever. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins 
to rescue us from the present evil age according to the will of God and Father to whom glory be um, to whom be glory forever and ever amen those are the prelude words to the book of Galatians and I thought that was appropriate here following on the text so may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. God has called each of us by name and to a life of faith. Accordingly, I wanted to make two points today in reflection of our scripture readings, but particularly from Paul's letter to the Galatians. And the first is, our surrender of things earthly to God strengthens our faith. And second, seeking, we will find our true name in Christ, the very core of our spiritual self. Paul, who absolutely knew his calling and his name, had made the greatest discovery of his whole life on the road to Damascus. That justification by faith is not just a theme God revealed to his heart and mind. It was the main point, or became the main point, uh, for Paul's entire life, as it is for us. Justification by faith means that we are made righteous in God's eyes solely through faith in Jesus Christ, period. Full stop. Sam, let me say that again. Justification by faith means that we are made righteous in God's eyes solely through faith in Jesus Christ. In today's passage, uh, Galatia, Paul, uh, uh, from Galatians, Paul writes, we know that a person is justified not by the works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. We have some belief in, Jesus, in Christ Jesus so that we might be justified by faith and not by doing the works of the law. If justification comes through the law, then Christ died for nothing. That was that final stanza. Now that is quite a discovery. We are not, nor can we be, justified, that is, made righteous, saved, um, sins exonerated by what we do, but only by faith in what God has already done for us in the death of his son, Jesus Christ, on the cross. Or as Eugene Peterson in the message interprets, the sacrificed Jesus made us fit for God, set us right with God. To understand Paul in his message for us better, we must appreciate some of the Old Testament readings too, based largely on the verbal tradition of the time that defined the word justified as being right or being in the right, a very fine state of being, if you were a privileged influential Pharisee of the time, blinded on his way to Damascus by a light from God, carried and deposited in a dark room, Paul was to quickly come to understand that this is what you learn after you know it all. Paul was a Jew from Tarsus, a Roman citizen who had received the best education possible for a Jewish young man. He had been tutored by the renowned Pharisee Gamaliel and was a rising star among the Pharisees. The Pharisees who had been observers and keepers of ritual purity and tithing for 250 years or more taught one main thing. Justification is required through works. 
particularly disciplined obedience to the laws of the Old Testament, as well as the hundreds of ceremonial and ritual laws that they had made up and memorized over time. Paul took great pride in his obedience to the law. Listen to how he confidently describes this in the letter to the Philippians. If anyone has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew, uh, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Wow. Do you honestly know anybody that talks that way anymore? In fact, Paul was so zealous for the law that he persecuted Christians, those who traveled, uh, those who believed in Jesus Christ, the one who fulfilled the law. Paul's persecution of Christians did not consist of mean emails or blistering Twitter feeds or accusing Facebook posts, but consisted rather of separating loved ones from one another, imprisoning those that disagreed with him, such as Stephen, who was executed. For Paul, righteousness through the works of the law and its complicated machinations were no mere religious hobby. It was to the be-all and end-all of his life. When it came to righteousness through the works of the law, Paul, in fact, knew it all. When Ananias came to that dark room and laid hands on Saul, his Roman name, and Paul's vision returned as scales falling from his eyes, he learned something, suddenly knew something had that counted more than anything, that we are justified only through faith in Jesus Christ alone, as he later wrote to the Philippians. Yet, whatever gains I had, I have come to count, regard these losses as nothing because of Christ. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and I regard them as rubbish. In order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness of God based on faith. And that was it for Paul. He spent the rest of his life traveling the Roman Empire, preaching the gospel, preaching justification, being right with God through faith in Jesus Christ, planting churches, suffering for the sake of Christ. Paul authored 13 of the 27 books of the New Testament, and the predominant recurring theme in all of them is justification through faith. It's what Paul learned after he knew it all that counted. And it's the same with us. We live in a meritocracy, a culture in which we are judged by our merits from cradle to grave. When my son Peter was born, um, he was, when my son Peter was very young, actually, when he was like five or six, I think. Um, I remember sharing one day with him, he was a very thoughtful young man, little boy at the time, mm, still is at 25, uh, how I thought that he could think about, how he could think about who he was and who he might become. What I suggested to him was that a man in the world, as a man in the world, uh, particularly the North American world, 
um, our culture was probably going to have the foremost expectation of him to be strong. Now maybe that was me imposing my upbringing or what I had perceived uh, as our society's expectations. But I think men are supposed to be strong, right? Um, I think it is not a stretch to agree that our society places that emphasis uh, on that specific characteristic or manner of being, um, so to speak. It's crept into media, into entertainment, in our literature, um, it's rife throughout our history, and it's present in many of our relationships. This specific expectation probably looms as a primary message for us, men and women, uh, to be strong out here in the West. At all costs, be strong, independent, free of dependencies, decisive, self-sufficient. I then suggested that to Pete that I thought maybe he had a different opportunity. To be gentle too. That somehow offsetting the str to strength alone, he could adopt gentleness as a characteristic, thereby somehow achieving a sense of balance as he matured. Knowing that Peter had, still does, a natural incl inclination to be gentle, I guess I wanted him to know that living into both could be intentional, self-directed, and faithful to the truth as he might discover that growing up as a person. That when people would meet him, and get to know him, they would think of him both as strong and gentle, as authentic um, as to who he is, his true name, his description, Peter the Rock. So, like Peter, uh, or like Paul, we too can ha have lives in a culture that places us in grooves, in tracks, or trajectories that can be difficult to change or alter at any age, at any stage. Paul's track was a straight and narrow one focused intensely and precisely on the law, the memorized law. He was faithful to that singular path, that track, it all, and it almost killed him. And it wasn't until God blinded him and drastically redirected his mind and heart that he began to see a new path and a new balance, a new life. So we too, as Christians, who learn about and yearn for the truth that reveals to us our calling, our right way of being, our name, our very essence. We listen for the Holy Spirit that helps us to redirect and reorder our lives around faith and works of faith. There is tremendously good news here. The Holy Spirit is always entirely for us. More than we are for ourselves, it seems. The Spirit speaks in our favor against the negative voices that judge and condemn us that sticks us in grooves, demands perfection, that tugs us away from spiritual balance and sustenance. This holy and true advocacy should give us such hope. Now, we do not have to do this one life all by ourselves or even do life perfectly, right? We can learn ever more, lean ever more toward a practice of faithfulness and trust in the one who, after all else, knows us best. The more we listen openly, the more we trust directions that lead us to a faith-centered life, 
we are easily distracted, we fall back. But then, as we listen again, and the relentless Holy Spirit nudges us again, and we feel the familiar warmth of good direction, a centeredness, and we want to listen more. Richard Rohr, in his book, a remarkable little book, Falling Upward, refers to this as cooperating, and this cooperating as a mystery that has been called the conspiracy of God, co-breathing with God. Thomas Merton wrote extensively about the ancients, the desert fathers who called this internal longing for wholeness, fate or destiny, the inner voice, or more commonly in our time, the call or our calling. Who doesn't, after all, like everyone to know his or her name? So listening for our name, that inner voice. It's a practice. Um, and uh, it's a practice that we can do to learn to be faithful. We spend our whole lives discovering who we are and what we are to be in this world. Maybe it is looking for balance between strength and gentleness. Maybe it is between courage and being humble, between being popular and being wise. For you, maybe it's a balance and faithful attention to other ways of being true to ourselves. God made us. We remember that Jesus taught us that we may be in the world, but we are not of the world. And in that scope or arc of time, our lives are preciously short. I know that in the end, it's just going to be me and my heart's desire, my Lord, the two of us. Until then, though, we meet each other, and we meet Christ in the world, and we learn our true names as we, in faith, as we practice and serve and sing and cry and laugh and tell stories and collaborate and watch for God. How it is that we can listen so, my friends, you know, um, you who I know to be searchers, like me, we are taught that there is vastly more reward in, um, in surrender, in being humble and gentle and considerate in all we do, being less so we may be more, being last so we may be first. So that in God's strength and love for us, he can enter in and be the offsetting value to imperfection. To be such a listener, a disciple, means to simply surrender. Surrendering, or surrendering our cares and our hopes and trials and tribulations and all worldly things so that we can adopt those values that energized the life of Jesus of Nazareth. And I want to read you um, what uh, Richard Rohr believes those values that energized Jesus' life are, and there's four of them. We adopt a commitment to a practice of enrichment of our relationship to God. We come to own an affirmation of real human need for love and the overwhelming value or worth of individuals, even in the face of demonic pretensions and principalities that want to control our lives and tell us what to believe and be. Third, we consistently express through our actions our desire to serve life out of love rather than through power, acquisition, and influence. And lastly, 
we find ourselves, we find within ourselves a deep identification with the poor and the hungry and the oppressed. These are the values that we can see in the life of Jesus. These are the values that lie in balance between grace and mercy. They are values that when affirmed and lived well make a profound difference in the quality of life in the world that is emerging. Um, it enables us to be teachers as well. And it's through these values that we can hear much more about who we are, who we might become, being bearers of the word in the name of Jesus Christ in all we do, remembering that justification by faith means that we are made righteous in God's eyes solely through faith in Jesus Christ. And God loves our faithfulness and promises to keep our faithfulness forever. Amen. So let, let's turn to hymn number, let's see here. We're going to sing, in, um, sing the faith, 2162, Grace Alone. So I'm going to try this without the microphone, and I'll just speak up. So I was reflecting um, for this morning about the table, and um, it's um, very instructive, I think, to understand that uh, 
that there's a, it's a tremendous gift, as we know. Um, but to, it, the table itself is expressed as um, the means of grace. So the sacraments are a means of grace. And, and it's offered to us freely uh, through the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. And it's a profound mystery, as we know, that a continued flow of mercy and love comes through uh, these ordinary elements. So I do invite all who believe in Jesus Christ as their Savior to come forward and join us. And we welcome you to this table.